Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video in my read-along series for Anthony Powell's amazing series, A Dark Themes of Time. Today I'm going to be talking about the tenth book in the series which we read in December and that is Books Do Furnish a Room. This is an interesting one and one that I really enjoyed, especially in the way that it looks at the publishing industry and the kind of literary world in the late 1940s. Weirdly, although I remember the early bits of the series quite well, the last three books of the series I really don't remember at all from the first time when I read these at the age of about 17, 18, which is weird because I would have read those later, but there we go, the early ones apparently stuck with me a bit more. So it was really interesting reading this and not remembering quite a lot of what happened, but having like deja vu moments and flash forwards as I kind of often do when reading this series. So as I usually do in these videos, I'm going to go through a quick summary of the plot and then I'm going to talk about some of the things I like about this book, a few of the interesting characters and some of the themes. So Books Do Furnish a Room takes place between about 1940 and 1947. At the beginning of it we find that Nick is working in Oxford doing some research for a book and while there he comes across Sillery and also um, a young man called Short who we haven't seen since I think the first book possibly who Nick went to university with. We also meet a young woman called Ada who is working as a secretary for Sillery and turns up later in this book as well. We also meet a man called Bagshaw whose nickname is Books Do Furnish a Room or just Books which is really fun, um, who is a man that Nick used to know from his Moreland days days. And in this chapter we also learn that George Holland has died some months before and also at the end of this chapter we learn immediately of the death of Eridge. Chapter 2 takes place at Eridge's funeral, of which lots of people turn up that Nick was not expecting to see, including Gypsy Jones, Howard Craggs, Quiggin and Widderpool and his wife Pamela, which is rather a surprise and is a bit weird. Also Mona is there, who um, you may remember from way earlier books, who used to be with Templar and then ran off with Quiggin. It turns out that Eridge was going to be involved in some way with finance Financing a new publisher slash magazine, well both called Fission, which is being started up and is going to have a left wing leaning, which is going to be run by Quiggin and Craggs, but also has some backing from Widderpool because he is interested in kind of left wing politics. Eridge was supposed to provide some money for this, whether or not any money has been left to the cause now that he's dead. It's kind of a matter of contention, which is why Widderpool and Co come to this funeral. We also learned the bag shot is going to be involved in this magazine as well as the editor and Quiggin manages to get Nick involved too as a book reviewer. In the middle of Eridus' funeral Pamela feels unwell and leaves the church. She then manages to get herself up to the house um, and get herself let into the house. She certainly doesn't seem to be well when everybody else turns up there and then later on in this chapter she is sick in a vase which then the rest of them have to wash out which is very Anthony Powell in its surreal humour but also not very niceness. Uh, chapter 3 consists of quite a few different scenes. In the first one Nick visits Colonel F and Mrs Ferez's party, so that's you, who used to be Jean Templer, now married to Colonel Ferez. Um, and it's interesting to see kind of Nick's detachment from Jean after all these years and her detachment too from her old life, adopting her husband's accent to a certain extent and making everybody think she is foreign. In the second scene Nick goes with Bagshaw to a pub in order to meet one of their writers, Ex Trapnel, who is rather important in this book. The third scene in chapter 3 is the fission party launch at which Nick encounters Odo Stevens again who is writing a book and also Trapnel and Wimberpool and Pamela are there as well. Pamela and Trapnel meet at this launch party and there is a suggestion that neither of them like each other although that turns out to be not quite right in chapter 4 where Nick meets Trapnel at the pub and Trapnel confesses that he is desperately in love with Pamela Wimberpool. After that Trapnel disappears for a little bit and Nick one night going round to Wimberpool's house to discuss a matter of business finds Pamela not there and Short, who is a neighbour of Wimberpool's, delivering a message which tells us that Pamela has run off, left Wimberpool and has gone off with Trapnel. Randomly out of the blue a little while later Pamela rings up Nick and asks him to come round to see Trapnel and when he does Wimberpool also turns up who has tracked them there and there is rather a bit of a scene which Pamela seems to quite enjoy. In chapter 5 we learn that after two years of being a publishing house and a magazine fission is done and over. Quiggin is getting married to Ada who was Sillery's secretary from the first chapter. Nick gets a call from Bagshaw saying he wants help with Trapnel who is drunk and has had a huge argument with Pamela and when Nick and Bagshaw go to help Trapnel and take him home they discover that Pamela has not only left him but also thrown the manuscript of his latest novel into the canal. 
you know, as you do. Also quite dramatic, what a scene. And at the very end of the book, Nick, in going to make inquiries at a school which he might send one of his children to, encounters again Labar, who we haven't seen for a very long time. So, lots going on in this book. Let's talk about some of the things I love. One thing I really enjoy in Books to Furnish a Room is the kind of exploration of the literary world and the publishing industry and kind of newspaper reviews of books and things like that. Partly I think just because I'm very interested in books and also I work in publishing so it's quite interesting to look at kind of 1940s literary world which is something I really like. I also I love the title of Books Do Furnish a Room and it's interesting that the title refers to Bagshaw who in some ways is not that central a character in this book like Tracknell is a much more central figure than Bagshaw I would argue but his nickname is used as the title partly because it refers to so many other things in this novel and how many like books and like the literary world is mentioned in this which is really interesting. Another thing I think is interesting to note in this book is the kind of lack of Nick's life. I mentioned as we go through this series quite a bit that it's very interesting how these the series is narrated by Nick but it's often not focused on Nick and in the early books it's more focused on him and the further you go through the less and less we get to learn about Nick's life. For example we know that in the course of this book he has a new baby and we know that when he goes to the school where he meets Labar he is making inquiries for sending a different child to school but we barely see Isabel in this book at all I think. We hear very little about the children, we don't know the children's names, but I don't think we even know how many children Nick has. I think it's quite interesting how the later books kind of move away, take a big step away from Nick's kind of personal home life. And also I, I always think like with this series it's partly because Adults from Music of Time is a bit like semi-autobiographical and there's a bit of like, I like to imagine there's a bit of Anthony Powell just like I don't want to write about my wife and children and I feel like that's intrusive so I'm not going to. I just think it's kind of sweet. Um, I don't know, maybe that's not why but Anyway, I think in this book there are some really kind of memorable scenes and some really powerful moments. I think the two moments that really stick out in my head, um, which I half remembered from the first time I was reading, especially the second one. One is Pamela being sick in that vase in this kind of grand Tolland household, this grand estate. And it's not really because she's ill or because she's pregnant as a lot of people speculate, it's just like because she's angry and she's just so angry and so annoyed with all this like pent up rage inside her that she's just is like sick in a vase um, and then everyone has to wash it out afterwards and they can't ask the servant to do it because the only servant they have is a young man who's a prisoner of war and they don't feel it's fair on him. All of these like semi-aristocratic people have to like wash out this vase that this woman's been sick in. In some ways it feels very like symbolic of the kind of decay of the class order post World War II. Um, maybe I'm reading too much into that, but that's kind of what I imagine. Like, the other very memorable moment I think in this book is um, Trapnell's manuscript floating down the canal when, when Pamela has thrown it in, which is just... it's it's such a memorable and awful moment. And the moment they were walking by the canal I thought, oh no, I remember what's gonna happen now. Um, and had this like moment of like, I think it's just so upsetting to people who like books, the idea that she could just like throw all his work away. It's also, it's quite ridiculous and it's very like theatrical, but that's very telling because that's the kind of person Pamela is and that's the kind of thing she likes. Anyway, let's move on to talking about some of the characters in this book. Let's talk about Books Bagshaw as he's an interesting character and kind of the title one in this book I suppose. Would anybody else who's been doing the read-along be able to tell me if they think he's mentioned in an earlier book? Because I can't remember, I don't think he is, but there's a lot of characters mentioned in passing in the early books that I might have missed. But certainly we know that Nick has known him on and off for a while, that he is a very unreliable but somehow seems to get by all right and also has a few kind of myths that follow him. He doesn't get on well with women pool because they're very, very different personalities, but he seems to get on fairly well with authors and fairly well with Nick. I also want to talk about X Trapnell himself, who I think in many ways is the kind of central figure in this book. Um, I've spoken before about how there are some books in A Dance and Musical Time which focus on like specific main scenes around which the rest of the book is framed, and some which seem to focus around a particular character. This book is quite X Trapnell heavy, although it was interesting, I didn't really clock until I was going through my summary that he doesn't turn up until a fair little way through the book. Um, but Ace Trapnell is quite interesting. We know that he's a kind of up and coming important writer. You know, there's a sense of his kind of theatrical, crazy personality, that he has all these kind of conflicting ambitions. He wants to be both rich and poor. He's always asking to borrow money off people at parties or pretty much whenever he can. And he never seems to have any money. He seems to be kind of off and on with lots of different women all of the time and always seems to have this kind of mess of a life. And then of course he ends up with Pamela, who he is deeply in love with. That's, I think, is why the canal scene and the manuscript floating down the canal is so powerful because Pamela is awful and we know this from the previous book. We know that she is callous and cruel and messed up and just like uncaring in so many ways but Trapnell loves her 
and she throws his book in a river. I think that just that just makes me very cross. I think the writer in me and the like reader in me is just really really upset by the fact that she destroys his book. I also of course want to talk about Pamela who is very important in this book as well and who is a very odd and interesting character who you get to kind of who kind of unfolds slowly and I think it's always interesting to see Nick has this kind of dual interest in her from the past in that she is Stringham's niece but also she's Liverpool's wife and so she is kind of connected to these two very important figures throughout his life and also because Nick is someone who she has an acquaintance with who she talks to who she seems to have some like not a fondness for she doesn't really like him but she doesn't have the same antipathy towards him as she does to a lot of people because he was her uncle's friend. I think it's interesting to see what this book kind of tells us more about Pamela. I spoke a little bit in my video on the military philosophy about why she marries Liverpool and there's a moment in this book where Nick says that he's kind of clocked that in his head, the only reason why Pamela married Wimmerpool was in order to run off with someone like Trapnell. And I think there's this kind of suggestion of Pamela kind of loving drama and almost kind of theatricality. She always seems very, very cold and bored, and maybe that's because she is bored, and therefore she kind of creates these complicated situations for herself. And she marries Wimmerpool in order partly to run off with someone else and then return to him to kind of push her power to the limits and also to kind of get this kind of drama going in a way. Like when Wibberpool storms in on her Trapnel and Nick having this conversation, Nick notices that Pamela's like really excited and really kind of enjoying the confrontation because that's kind of what she wants. And similarly in the like throwing the book in the canal when she leaves Trapnel is such a like dramatic, over the top thing to do that it just kind of shows she's like trying to make something interesting of her life in a way. I don't know, she's such a curious character. Before I move on to the themes, I want to discuss Witherpool a bit as well. It's very interesting in this book to see his reaction to Pamela leaving him, which is mostly to like avoid scandal at all cost. He doesn't seem to mind that much that Pamela's gone off with another man and he takes her back willingly. It's not exactly jealousy that he has, it's more concern about reputation and he circulates these false reports um, that she's just kind of gone away on holiday temporarily, she's coming back etc. Because what in many ways he's married Pamela for is reputation and people knowing he has a beautiful wife. Like, you don't ever really get the impression that they have a very good happy relationship, they don't really seem to know each other and they definitely don't seem to understand each other. Wimmerpool keeps his cool remarkably well when discovering that she has left him and also tries to kind of hush it up as soon as possible possible, which I think is quite telling about his personality and the kind of man he is. There are a few themes I want to talk about in this book, although I think this is one of those ones that is more kind of character than theme driven. It's very still like quite Pamela driven. Um, so there aren't too many themes I want to talk about, but there are a few. One is just the like bookish themes in this and the kind of literary world, which is something I find really interesting. And the kind of figure of a right of the writer as a motif and a theme throughout this is very interesting. Trapnel in many ways fits into lots of stereotypes about writers, you know, no money, slightly drunk, um, disordered genius I suppose in many ways which is very different to the way like Nick approaches being a writer and Nick is of course writing a book about a writer at the same time and is also reviewing books for a magazine produced by a publisher of books and the editor he is working for is nicknamed Books. There's just a lot of a lot of books in here which is something I obviously enjoy and like I said I find learning about the kind of publishing world really really interesting here and also it's nice to kind of encounter Quiggan and Mark members and those kind of literary figures who we encountered in earlier books too who were a bit kind of absent in the war books. Another really interesting kind of theme and motif throughout this is sort of post-war life. Nick says at one point in this book one that after the war one returns to a different world. The idea that everything has changed and nothing can be the same again. They talk about you know only the very rich people being able to have alcohol and that Colonel Ferez and his wife Jean have so decent amount of it is quite like impressive. At one point Nick talks about how all conversation topics have been revised and changed like for the last six years there's been so many things everyone's been talking about which no one can talk about anymore and no one really knows quite what they're doing. And then we also have kind of other echoes of the war going throughout. For example the new kind of butler slash um, servant at the Tollens Grand Country Estate is a German prisoner of war. It's a suggestion of this kind of new wave and new generation of literary people. People like Ada and Trapnel. Nick is no longer part of that young generation, he is now one step above. There's also, as I already spoken about, kind of hints of classes falling apart which we get quite 
a lot of during the war books as well and now there is a sense that kind of class is disintegrating quite a lot and especially I think you see that in the kind of aristocratic Tolland family and the way their kind of behaviour has changed and also in the kind of left-wing politics that a lot of the characters in this book subscribe to. And I think that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about in terms of books we furnish a room. I hope you're continuing to enjoy the read-along. There's only two books left to go so I'm listening to the 11th book in the series Temporary Kings at the moment and there should be a video up for that by the end of January as well. I'm sorry this one is a little bit late but December was quite a busy crazy month um, so there we go. Please let me know down in the comments if you're carrying on with the read-along and what you thought of this book and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.